Hello and a very, very warm welcome. My name is Tanya Beckett. I'm a BBC broadcaster and journalist, and it is my very great pleasure to be hosting this session on the future of travel. And BBC Global News is delighted also to be here at the virtual world travel market this year. As we know, the pandemic has been devastating to many, many economies and businesses, but in particular, I think it's fair to say to the travel sector. The world travel Travel and Tourism Council estimates that the global economic impact of COVID could be five times greater than that absorbed in the 2008 financial crisis. As well as forcing the industry to rethink how it needs to operate in the short term to win back tourists, the, cra the crisis has also placed a huge amount of risk in the spotlight, the question of risk, the risk businesses face, for example, in the volatile and unpredictable situations in which they find themselves as well as the amount of risk that travellers are themselves willing to take. So how will the travel industry now balance those risks going forward and crucially rebuild confidence? That's the key focus of this discussion that we'll be having in the next hour this afternoon. And we're looking ahead a few years to what the travel industry will look like in the future and examining the long term changes we can expect to see. So please join me in welcoming uh, my panel of experts that we have with us this afternoon. Um, Luis Arujo, who is the president of the Portuguese National Tourism Authority. John uh, Duvia, who is the director of membership and financial services at ABSA. Welcome to you. Alan French, who's the CEO of Thomas Cook in the UK. And Carrie Quick, who is the executive director for Europe for the Singapore Tourism board welcome to you all john if i can uh, start with you and abda and it's worth saying that of course in the last couple of days we've had news about the possibility of a vaccine the pfizer vaccine emerging but you know there are others hot on their heels how how warmly do you welcome that news or how optimistic are you that that news could change the predicament that the travel industry now finds itself in good afternoon tanya and welcome to all of our delegates today um it's good it's good to be together even in this virtual world it's not not quite the same is it um so tanya i think it's it is good news clearly is good news very positive um but i think we also have to keep it in context um for the immediate health and recovery of tourism um we've got to look at the window between now and when those vaccines are going to arrive and actually deploy to the population at large and um, I think the importance of the vaccine announcement yesterday uh, probably speaks more in the short term to the confidence of the financial markets and others around our industry um, who, alongside us, can now see the route through to recovery in the medium term. But in the immediate term, I think the industry is still very focused on the need for governments to get their act together around uh, travel restrictions, around travel corridors, uh, enabling travel uh, and around the regime for testing um, to enable travel in the medium term. So uh, vaccine is very good news. I think it sets a different tone, the sentiment towards our sector, but it's something that in reality for most travellers is probably only going to be relevant as we get into, well, we don't know yet, do we? But, you know, later spring and summer, um, we've got to get our industry through the winter first. OK, so it's not certainly not an overnight game changer. And I, th yeah, I think it's fair to say it won't be for society either. But, John, I I've given an indication of how devastating this pandemic has been for the travel industry. But maybe you could elaborate on that. Just give us an overview of exactly how much damage it's done. Yeah, well, it's it's been fundamental, hasn't it, for all of us in all, all aspects of our lives. I've been in the industry for 40 years this September, just gone. And... Uh, I think it's something I've heard a lot of colleagues say, but I've really seen nothing like it. Uh, we've dealt with many crises, conflicts, um, SARS, so many things um, over the years. But to have a single crisis that actually involves every consumer in every source market, every industry employee in those source markets, every form of transportation and everyone involved in the transportation supply chain to affect every destination, all the communities, all the employees in destinations, um, you know, to have something that just touches absolutely everything and everyone is is truly unique. I think uh, we've not seen anything like this before. And then you add to that the duration of this crisis. So we've gone on now for eight months. 
Uh, and realistically, it looks like we're going to be pretty much a year in the sort of state that we're in at the moment. We've, we've never seen anything like that before. Um, so it has been absolutely horrendous for almost everyone in our industry. I think equally, I've been absolutely amazed by the resilience of the sector. You know, if I look at my day job in the UK dealing with financial protection, actually the number of failures of travel companies in the UK, I think has been remarkably small, uh, in fact, mm -hmm. given, given the seriousness and the duration of it. But let's not, not let's underestimate um, the impact, you know, for all of us as consumers, as businesses, uh, communities, it's, it's been pretty fundamental. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've been very critical of, of, of government, our government and of governments generally to some degree in their, in their response, but good, goodness me, I wouldn't like to be in their shoes. We've all been navigating this, making very, very, very difficult decisions and learning as we go through. So it's been pretty, pretty fundamental. Existential is a phrase that we've heard used, and it, it probably for once is not being overstated. Yeah. OK, John, thank you for that um, and, and emphasising just how difficult a time this has been for the travel industry. It's very difficult to imagine um, exactly what it's been going through for many of us, I think. Uh, Lewis, if we come to you and also Carrie, I want to get a picture of some of the measures and how you've been coping with this. Now, uh, let's let's start with Portugal. And Luis, if we could start with you. Um, tourism is incredibly important to the Portuguese economy, isn't it? So just explain to me a little bit how Portugal has been managing through this crisis. Well, hello, Tania. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Um, yes, terribly important. Uh, almost 14% of the GDP, 10% of the workforce. Uh, but most important, we've been uh, growing a lot over the past years. Just to give you an idea, uh, in four years, the revenues from the tourism sector grew more than 60%, 6 six zero. Uh, to be precise, 64%, just in four years. And uh, what we see now is we went back 25 years. So the amount of revenues we're having and guests we're having this year, 2020, is exactly the same we had in 1995. The problem is we have 10 times the number of companies. We have increased the workforce in more than 50%. So it's extremely difficult for a country like Portugal that of course has a very strong internal tourism. One third of our tourists are from Portugal, two thirds uh, foreigners uh, to survive um, because the, uh, the lack of mobility, the lack of trust in our clients and in all, all our tourists, it's terrible for, for the industry and for the industry. And I agree with John, we see a resilience from the sector that it's only possible when you have a country that is so steadily uh, betting on tourism for so many years. So, uh, of course, we believe in the future. It's going to be completely different. That's for sure. We're going to talk about that. Um, but the situation now is uh, not only uncertain, uh, but we need to find answers immediately because time here is crucial for the activity. Mm. Carrie, um, Singapore has often been held up as an example of uh, how it is done, particularly in the context of track and trace. Uh, how has Singapore navigated through this, its tourism industry through this crisis? Well, I, I think, um, you know, just to set the context, in 2019, we, we had about 19.1 million visitors to Singapore. And uh, in the first nine months of 2020, we we're at about 2.7 million visitors. So we are down by about 81%. So the impact on our local tourism industry is really immense. Um, and we have... We, we can't just rely on uh, domestic uh, tourism. So having a slow and gradual opening and uh, looking to see how we can uh, reopen our international travel borders in a safe manner has been uh, critical. Um, as you said, um, you know, the, the key things for us um, is how do we keep um, the Singaporeans and our local tourism workers and any of the international visitors uh, within Singapore safe um, as we gradually re uh, recover. Um, so really, uh, we're looking at how we can strengthen our contact tracing um, abilities using technology 
uh, we have to expand our testing capacity um, and also make sure that we have a robust um, healthcare uh, capacity. And we also invest in vaccine research. So as you said, you know, they, they, uh, we were also very uh, happy to hear the news. Uh, but uh, of course, there's cautious optimism um, because we think that that will take time uh, for the, the testing uh, to uh, and, and launch of the vaccine. So we need to continue to invest in strengthening our health uh, protocols. Um, in, in Singapore, um, other than ensuring that, um, you know, we have a robust uh, scheme to ensure high levels of uh, safety and hygiene uh, through uh, what we call the SG Clean Initiative, which is a national uh, accreditation uh, framework, which has already uh, accredited about 27,000 uh, businesses in Singapore to date. Um, we are also looking at how our tourism players have um, to, to adapt uh, to the new traveler. Um, and I think one of the things that has been quite key to this is uh, trying to get them to undertake digital transformation. Um, for us, we've launched uh, a tourism transformation uh, index, uh, which is a tool that our tourism players can actually use to uh, identify what are their strengths and also maybe opportunities where they can take a uh, you know, few extra steps uh, in terms of moving forward in digital transformation. We've also got a tourism accelerator program, uh, which is uh, something that helps to match startups from uh, around the world uh, with our local tourism companies uh, to hopefully create a pipeline of you know, innovative solutions that can help us to get over uh, some of these challenging times. And lastly, we think that uh, continued investment in uh, marketing efforts uh, by our industry stakeholders, both locally as well as our international partners is very important. So we've also uh, launched a marketing partnerships program to help to co-fund some of these initiatives um, to, to look forward. Carrie, so it sounds like there are a number of initiatives there trying to underpin the recovery process. Um, if if, if um, I can uh, come over to you, Alan, and ask, what do you think is going to underpin recovery in the sector? Is it confidence in terms of health for visitors and tourists? Is it confidence in terms of, you know, they know that if they book a holiday, then then they will be able to go on that holiday and that, that travel restrictions won't prevent them? What is it that underpins it? I think you're right to point out that confidence is the thing that that sits underneath it and consumers and customers and travelers all want to have more confidence in the decisions that they make. I'm not sure that there's a single silver bullet. I think it will develop over a period of time and we'll, we can talk about the long term future um, afterwards. But I do think that this summer has shown us a couple of areas where trust in the industry really does need to be built up. I think one of them is that is, is fiscal trust, so that knowing that if you have bought a holiday, that actually if it all goes pear-shaped, you can do something about that um, in a transparent and usable way. And uh, I think we've all been, uh, we've all seen the news in the news reports around that. I think the other one is um, looking at destinations and understanding the risks of traveling to those destinations, and in particular in the UK, the risks to coming back. So the, the health risk seems to be divided up into sort of two dimensions. The first is, what do you need to do to get to a country? And then the second is, what do you need to get back? And you're looking into, looking into the future a little bit, that's going to be quite confusing. The testing regimes that are being looked at by governments, I mean, I've seen four separate tests being demanded by different destinations, and there seems to be at the moment, those are being done independently. And then as you come back from those countries, the, the, um, the quarantine and the testing processes that the UK government will put in place as you come back is also quite difficult to, to see. So I think the, 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 the healthcare trust around this is going to be something that will take a fair amount of effort to navigate. And I think we'll need both governments and regulatory bodies to come together to help us process this. And I think then the vaccine in the long term, I think, is also going to play a crucial role. But there's going to be a, a, um, you know, a period of time before the vaccine arrives where testing is going to have to be put in place. And whether it's rapid antigen testing, PCR testing or so forth, we're going to have to coordinate all of that. So I think trying to make that clear to the customer and trying to help the customer through that process is going to be something that travel companies are really going to have to get on the front foot to help navigate. 
Okay, before I move on to um, other issues, I wanted to just say, um, I welcomed the guests at the beginning, but I wanted to say that you can send in your questions if you're listening to this. Um, if you look at the right of your screen, um, you can um, use the question function there, and we are looking forward to hearing from you, so please uh, send those in. Um, just before I, I move on to another subject, Alan, do you imagine that the travel industry is going to want some sort of I don't know, vaccination passporting in the way that we've seen in the past with yellow fever? I would imagine eventually governments are going to need to find a way of, of helping through that. So I think the travel industry is, is probably not going to be the body that drives that. But I think that governments will want assurances, people traveling from areas with high incidence of the disease to low areas of incidence, but the disease will require different regulatory frameworks, I think, than people who are broadly on the same footing. So I can see, you know, people and, I, and talking to people in, for instance, China or Australia or New Zealand versus the UK and the US, quite different approaches to how they're going to want to manage this. And I don't think it's going to be simple to put in place. You know, we, we talked a little bit about trust and confidence. Actually, there's a lot of news floating around about how easy it is to fabricate some of the test certificates. So I think that there's going to be a push by different governments to try and make sure that people who are coming through their borders um, are who they say that they are and are actually vaccinated or tested to the level that they would like. Okay, there's a question that's come in here, which I think is quite interesting, um, which says, uh, do you expect to use the, the continue the use of digital tools and VR marketing, even virtual reality, I assume that means, even post-COVID when travel resumes to normal. Advances in these sectors have come on so much recently, it might be a shame to lose it. So we've talked through a lot of the problems that the travel sector has experienced, but it is true, um, if we can be positive for a moment, that a lot has been learned in many sectors. So um, Carrie or Louis, uh, if I could come to either of you, Louis, let's come to you first if we may. Mm -hmm. What has the travel sector learned? Has it forced a speed of development that otherwise simply wouldn't have happened. Well, we le we, we've learned a lot, that's for sure. And it, I agree with you, it would be a shame to lose what we've learned uh, in terms of the importance of having a seamless and now also a safe experience when traveling, uh, which I think was something we were all looking for and now it has accelerated. Uh, how can we travel easily between countries. And I think there's nothing worse than losing something to realize how important it is. And when you see countries with different approaches in terms of what kind of limitations you put to other nationalities, what, which is exactly what we're seeing now with the quarantines and the decisions taken from one day to the other, then it's really important to realize that we need to establish clear protocols and clear rules even between ourselves, agreements, in order to allow this uh, mobility and this seamless experience together with a safe traveling. So I would say it's really important. I think all the technology has been a, a big enabler of all the changes that we've seen and will keep for the future. Uh, we have different concerns in, in terms of consumers. Uh, they need more um, predictable uh, approach into traveling. Uh, you can't travel to a country without knowing that that country for the next two weeks or three weeks or whatever uh, won't close the borders, won't stop accepting other nationalities, will allow you to leave your own country back. And we've seen over the past months decisions taken from one day to the other. This is not positive not only in terms of building the trust on the consumer, but also in the companies. Because when we talk about confidence, we talk about tourists. But we need to understand that our companies, any countries, even the ones in Singapore, need trust. They need to understand that they have rules and that their governments and the international organizations understand that this has to be taken very seriously. Uh, of course, without putting into prejudice our health or anyone's health, yeah. but at least trying to find a balance. And I really enjoy the title of balancing risk and restoring confidence, because this is what we're talking about right now. It's about balance. Um, so I, I do understand. And I think that in many other issues, 
we have to take notice uh, and we have to pay attention of what we learned and project it into the future. Hmm. Carrie, your thoughts on, on what may have been learned? You, you gave a quite a long list of things um, that have been put in place uh, uh, across the uh, offering financial security um, and so on to the sector and also health um, considerations. But what do you think the sector has learned that it might be able to take into a post-COVID world? Um, I think uh, going uh, to, to the question in terms of, you know, whether we think that we will continue uh, and, um, you know, adopt some of these uh, learnings in, in digital technology uh, advancements, uh, even after uh, things get better, I think certainly uh, we are a proponent of, of seeing how we can continue um, to provide content uh, in a virtual manner. I think... Um, one of the lessons that we learned uh, during this uh, past couple of months is that it is uh, continually important to invest in ways to engage our overseas audience, even though they can't travel to Singapore. Um, so having, you know, virtual, uh, a lot of our, uh, for example, events uh, in, in Singapore uh, were cancelled, but they, uh, we helped them to repivot to actually um, allow for a, a virtual event experience instead. Um, and this uh, was quite successful for something like the Singapore Food Festival, uh, where we actually enlarged our audience base uh, because we were able to reach out um, to share engaging content, um, you know, with uh, live masterclasses and with virtual tours. Um, and and this, this is important for us going forward. So even in future, if we can continue to have a, a, a you know, relaunch a live event, we still see um, a virtual or hybrid element still continuing perhaps to be the new norm. Um, even in business, I think events, that's something that uh, may become more of a, a permanent uh, offering. Um, and our, our business partners in Singapore are also looking at ways in terms of making hybrid events um, something uh, that's the norm for the future. Um, we are, uh, as a board, uh, you know, uh, also looking at augmented reality, um, you know, as a means to enhance the immersive experience uh, and, and seeing how uh, we can uh, develop a, a strategy uh, where eventually uh, many of our tourism players uh, can perhaps uh, come on board and be able to be uh, better at providing uh, digital content, because I think these are all new tools and new ways in which we are able to engage an audience. And, and you never know, uh, there will, it will take time for us to get back um, uh, and, and there will be a new norm. So mm. we will continue to look at technology as one of the enablers. Mm. John, um, the engagement in technology um, here has has changed the sector for good, probably, and, and allowed, I don't know, allowed a flexibility, probably, and a different way of looking at the tourist experience. I think that's right, Tanya, and um, I think just link a couple of comments together that uh, others have already made. I think technology is going to play uh, a role in the execution of travel, so the, the simpler uh, for the consumer whatever the, the tests requirements that they're going to have to go through, um, particularly in short to medium term, can be made, um, the better. You, you made a sort of an analogy to the yellow fever regime. Mm. Um, I think, you know, if we're going to have ongoing inoculations and boosters, and that might be a, you know, really elegant solution that gets everybody back towards a much more normal situation. I think the simpler that can be made, um, point that Alan made, the acceptance of those around the world, almost the equivalent sort of the electronic uh, travel authorities that, that we see that link to people's passports, um, you know, that that's going to make a real difference. I think part of the problem we have at the moment is that people find it very difficult to understand and be certain of the requirements and how they change. And I think uh, one of Luis's points is these changes just on a day or two notice and you get then the kind of media coverage of what sounds like an evacuation of Brits from country X back back home to beat the deadline. I mean, these are really unhelpful yeah. dynamics and things that I don't think any of us really believe actually help in any real material way to our domestic community's health um, position, rushing people back in a hurry over a few days compared to coming back on their normal return date. What, what difference really um, did that ever make, I wonder? I think the other really interesting piece for me with 
technologies, seeing what a, a lot of destinations are doing, because being able to travel and having the, as it were, the legal um, permission, the official permission to be able to do that is one thing, but we, we need people to want to go because they're confident about the destination's experience. So it's not even VR or uh, any, any, any form of AI, it's actually just people being able to see in, in mm -hmm. it's not new technology, really, it's just, mm -hmm. just good old fashioned video for what, what is the, what, what was the uh, offer yesterday? What did it look like? Is that resort really open and there's life there and there's a reason for me to go? And I think actually uh, just a kind of different way of using existing technology to, to deliver that reassurance to consumers that they still want to go to the destination. I think that's actually going to be a really important part for the, you know, for the, for the interim for our industry. Hmm. Um, Alan, coming back to you, do you think that this experience has profoundly changed how people see their holidays you know is it are they approaching them really with a different mentality do you think um certainly in the short term they are i mean yeah. people are looking at holidays through a risk lens they're wondering how likely they are to get infected on holiday and what the impact of them coming back into the uk is i think that'll change over a period of time i do think that the market will come back next year i think vaccine and testing are going to play critical parts parts of that and i think as it becomes more normalized and these checks and balances become part of day-to-day -day, um the day-to-day -day travel experience people will go back to being excited by the fact that they can go on a family holiday and you know be inspired by stories of other people going on those holidays and i think that will bring us all back to some some level of of, of normality um mm. i do think do, that you think, do you think people might go for longer holidays um do you think they might go for holidays where they can work while they're on holiday is it that uh, of yeah I, th I think that is really interesting i think this whole work from home dynamic is going to change the way that we live um, and I think holidays become part of that. So extended stays abroad, I think, are likely to be part of that. I think also choosing destinations, the choice of destinations is probably going to be on a slightly different criteria as we go forward. So rather than just saying, well, you know, it's Spain, Greece or Turkey, which is, you know, some of the destinations or Portugal, some, some of the destinations we will actually start to nuance that a little bit and think about how we can go there, how we can stay there, what the processes are like, what actually the um, healthcare issues are like, if in fact you wind up running the risk of catching COVID while you're there. So I think it yes. is going to be different. Lewis, can you imagine that people traveling to Portugal might expect to be much more, become more part of the fabric of the country and stay longer? Is that how you're thinking? Yeah, well, well definitely yes. And I think that's, um, um, it, it's not a, a fashion or it's, it's not something that it's temporary. I think it's more permanent. Uh, we've, we've realized that we need, and we've been, we've been working over the past years a lot in that sense. Uh, we don't promote just Portugal or our regions or the gastronomy. It's a way of life. We have a strong purpose, which is welcoming everyone and respecting the differences. Uh, of course, it's very valuable at this time, but um, we understand and we felt that even during these months that people came, of course, especially from Spain, uh, other European countries from the UK when they were allowed um, to Portugal. And I have to tell you, it, it was a boom when we went to the Green Corridor from British uh, tourists coming to Portugal at that time. I think it will change and it's not only uh, temporarily, it will change permanently the contact with nature, the uh, discovering the entire country, not only the, the, the special destinations or the main touristic attractions. It's something that we've been working. I have to tell you that over the past years, Portugal has grown more in the interior of the country and regions that were not so well known, like the Azores Islands or the center of Portugal, uh, than the main destination. So I think it will prevail and it will stay. But on the other hand, I think we should address that into the future uh, because we're dealing with the COVID-19, but we don't know if we will have a COVID-21. And the, our biggest concern is how can we be prepared for that? How can we be prepared for other situations like this one? How can our companies, we launched a SEAL 
which is the clean and safe. We have more than 23,000 establishments in Portugal from museums to restaurants that say they comply with rules regarding health and cleaning the establishment. Uh, we, we gave training to more than 25,000 people in Portugal in four months just for this seal. And this will stay over the, I, I think it will stay for the future. Um, uh, of course, it, with all, it, it depends on the markets, it depends on the people who want to visit us. But I think this is, and when you asked previously, what, what was the biggest lesson? The biggest lesson was listening to the consumer and to the customer. Uh, especially now in times of scarcity. Uh, 2019, we had 27 million tourists in one year. We have roughly 5 million this year so far. So you can see that it's really uh, difficult to challenge, to, 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 to foresee the future. But I would say that definitely, definitely these issues will be addressed in Portugal and I think in any destination for sure. Mm. Carrie, we've had a question in um, saying thank you for mentioning uh, augmented reality and virtual reality and just wanting a few more examples around that. Um, in terms of, um, I think, the, the, the way in which we are working together with the industry, I would still say it is work in progress, um, especially for augmented reality. Um, I think that, uh, you know, COVID has accelerated um, our prioritization of a lot of these things. And in fact, we think that augmented reality will become mainstream sooner um, uh, because of, of the need to um, engage and provide more immersive experiences. Um, I think we go back to the fact that uh, we don't know what will happen in terms of the reopening uh, timelines. Nobody knows. Uh, we can always have a second wave or a third wave. So we have to be able um, to uh, have in place, um, you know, strong uh, uh, schemes that will help us uh, to ensure that our tourism uh, partners can continue to, to do their work uh, during, uh, you know, the, the low periods of, uh, of um uh, visitors uh, arriving into Singapore and and technology is one way to uh, have that outreach. Um, I think if I may go uh, to the theme of you know building up trust, um, which mm. has uh, been brought up, um, I think for us it's really about you know three things. One is you know the track record in which a destination has managed uh, the pandemic. Um, the second one is really about communication uh, that is clear and and timely and transparent, um, and and this has been you know something that I think uh, has been critical to um, help to raise confidence uh, for, for the traveling community. Mm -hmm. uh, the third one is, of course, um, the types of uh, health and safety protocols that you have in the destination, uh, which is could be through you know, national certification schemes like we have in both Portugal and in Singapore. Um, and um, these things are fundamentally what we need to continue to put a lot of emphasis on, even if you know, there are positive signals uh, for vaccine research um, and um, you know, uh, the ability to actually have uh, a vaccine available sometime, hopefully, in 2021. Um, in terms of the, I guess, the, the audiences that we see, um, I think to add on to, to Louise, I think we, we, do, we do look at digital nomads. I think many destinations today are looking at this, you know, uh, um, group uh, that we call digital nomads who can actually, they're very mobile, uh, they can work out from any uh, place um, and it's how to give them a conducive environment uh, to, to live out of another country uh, as a remote uh, worker or a freelancer or an entrepreneur uh, for three to five months out of the year. Uh, so I think that is something that all of us uh, are looking at. And I think Portugal and Estonia are some countries that have actually got uh, uh, further along in terms of having a visa even. Um, but, but I think that's very interesting, um, you know, in terms of a up and coming segment, travel segment. Mm. Okay, um, there's also this question which people have mentioned, this question of insurance and, you know, the financial infrastructure that surrounds the industry. Um, I think I'm wondering, um, John, if I could come to you for this one and ask, uh, is the insurance world changing that surrounds the travel industry? I don't know how much about how integrated it is with the sector. Um, yeah, I think it's an absolutely key issue. And I, I think parts of the financial services and insurance world 
uh, have stepped up to the mark and supported our industry and other industries in this uh, pandemic, and others, frankly, have not. Um, if you take the UK picture as an example, we've had a situation where the uh, UK financial services regulator has intervened to take test cases uh, against the major insurers providing business interruption um, cover. And, um, you know, frankly, that happened because the major insurers involved um, sought to walk away completely um, from their, uh, what we would say were responsibilities to their policyholders. Um, and that's really undermined uh, confidence in that market. The credit insurance markets, um, similarly, really important in the supply chain, important uh, also to consumer protections where, um, say, you know, travel agents taking uh, credit insurance for their customers against the risk of airline failure or other supplier failures. Mm. And most of these covers have just been withdrawn uh, on very short notice. Um, and steps like that undermine confidence. So, yeah, I think it's it's an area that that industry and how we work with that industry it is going to be important to the future. I mean, to be fair to them, pandemic's the same for us for them as for us you know it, it is unprecedented and we're all um entering into new territory here and working out how to navigate it but i think like a lot of the things uh talking we've talked about governments chopping and changing policies and positions um you know stability of commercial relationships in the supply chain including financial services where everyone kind of trusts that people are going to step up to the plate on the night and that that those things will work that they can rely on them is going to be really, really important in the future. And uh, you know that hasn't that hasn't worked in in every respect. Um, Alan touched on earlier in his sort of opening remarks around consumer confidence and trust in our sector. So I think there are areas where it's worked extremely well. Financial protection. You know we've seen no problems. Talking again about the, my UK market example, where I work. You know that has operated um, very well indeed. But in terms of the refund processes, particularly with airlines, that has not worked well. Um, confidence in our sector has suffered from constant media discussion about delayed refunds or consumers being uh, forced to accept vouchers and not being able to convert them to, to refunds or rebooking. And that, that just adds to the undermining of confidence. So there are, there are a lot of lessons um, in, in many areas of what we do in financial services, insurance, uh, certainly one of those. You've touched on it before, but I'd like to ask all of our panellists about uh, government coordination. Just go through all of you and give a quick answer if you would. This really underpins what the recovery of the industry, doesn't it? As you have said, John, um, the go government behaviour, and I'm thinking just alone, the UK here, when you get changing travel restrictions, that is an impossible environment for companies to work in. So, um, Alan, if I could just come to you, what would you like to see, uh, fairly briefly, if you wouldn't mind, from governments. Uh, as I say, we now have the possibility of a vaccine. Testing is becoming more commonplace and more sophisticated. What is it you want governments to do? Yeah, I, I suppose there'll be three things. There'll be uh, firstly, transparency. So, I mean, a certain set of rules that are applicable as universally as they can sensibly be, whether that's the testing standards, whether that's making sure that the people who carry those certificates are the right people, whatever it is. I think the second is trying to do that with enough time for the industry to be able to react to it. Um, I think it's been mentioned before, trying to react um, on the back foot to something is really hard to do. So if we're able to get some, you know, some forewarning of what's been going on, I think that would be really helpful. I think the third thing is actually coordinating that activity with other bodies. So we're making sure that, you know, if you take a test leaving the UK, that test is not only accepted by the destination that you go to, but actually a week later, it's taken into account when you come back, because those are the sorts of things that can really take the hassle out of uh, out of the, the travel business. Uh, Louis, if I could come to you, what sort of coordination would you like to see governments involve in now? Well, I, I would say that, um, and, and Alan touched very, very precise points that we truly need coordination. I would say we'd see this in three different levels. First, inside the tourism sector between public and privates, which I think it's fundamental right now, having the private sector 
agreeing and trying to impl implementing the protocols that are established by the health authorities, that's crucial. The second one uh, is between tourism and other sectors, especially health. We can't keep talking inside our own bubble and uh, we need to talk with health authorities, establishing that mobility is crucial for us. It might not be, mobility is, is one of the ideas that the, the, the virus spreads more with mobility and people moving from one place to the other might not be as accurate. So we need to have data and specific information on how this works because we're all, prepared to implement from airline companies to airports to restaurants and hotels and destinations, a seamless and safe traveling experience. And, the only, and this will provide more data for the health authorities. So this is the second level. And the third level, uh, I say Alan just touched it, it's between national and international authorities. Uh, when we talk about the World Health Organization, the ECDC inside Europe, we need to understand which are the concerns. We need to have very explicit and transparent data on how the, very, the, the virus acts. And we will help them to implement measures or protocols or whatever to address that issue too. And uh, what we feel now is that everyone is speaking, is running on their own track. We should be running together. That's our biggest concern right now. Hmm. Carrie. What are your thoughts on how you would like international cooperation? Um, I, I, I guess um, I, I, the Singapore Tourism Board is a bit different. I mean, we are, uh, you know, our, our parent ministry is the Ministry of Trade and Industry in, in Singapore. Um, and I think for us, uh, this whole theme of um, private and public uh, collaboration is very important. Um, and and it can be seen in some of the work that we have already uh, been doing in Singapore. So whether or not it's the restarting of our business events through the safe uh, business events framework, um, you know, or the uh, cruise uh, uh, pilot to, to reopen uh, the cruise industry, we have always uh, communicated uh, very closely with the industry uh, when we come up uh, with certain protocols. Um, I agree that there, there is uh, a lot of it that is driven from uh, epidemiological perspective. Um, so the um, insights from our health ministries will always be very important in, in some of the decisions that are taken. Uh, but uh, for us, I think at the moment, uh, we have uh, platforms that have already been developed. So this kind of open uh, communication um, and timely information um, is already happening uh, in Singapore for some of the ways uh, to guide some of our recovery efforts. Mm. Okay, so I, I also wanted to um, do another quick fire round and ask all of you how you see the industry maybe in 12 months time. Um, Alan, let's, let's start with you if we can. Where is the industry in, in 12 months time? And, you know, taking on board the fact that it has learned some lessons here and it has advanced in some areas, no question. Yeah, no, I, I'd like to see the industry in, in 12 months' time. So I've taken an optimistic view of it. I, I, you know, I, I'd like to see vaccine and, and, uh, and uh, testing coming together to allow the freedom to travel to wherever people wanted to go to. So if we saw, saw, saw that, I think the longer term trends that we're starting to see are people going on holiday, perhaps less to destinations just for two weeks in the sun, and more to sort of have experiential holidays. So that, that's a kind of longer term trend we're seeing. We are seeing a trend towards um, also city breaks and people getting away for, for shorter breaks, again, usually around some kind of mission rather than just, uh, the traditional two weeks um, in the sun. So I think we're starting to see the holiday market um, break up a little bit. And I think people are also looking for recommendations and something exciting to think about which again comes back to this experiential thing so people are looking for something different to get away from um so i think we'll start to break up a little bit um from the mainstays that we've got and we'll see lots of little companies standing up um trying to fill those niches mm, interesting louis uh, what where do you see your industry or what are your hopes? Let's, let's put it optimistically. Ah. What are your hopes for the industry in 12 months time, Lewis? Well, uh, I, I, will, I, I will say what, what we are working for 
uh, in terms of Portugal and how, how I see the industry as a whole, not only about Portugal, it's about the tourism sector and the tourism industry as a whole. In Portugal, uh, we're working human resources. Uh, we've learned that it's, um, it's very effective, effective to use technology on digital training. We've trained more than 64,000 people in four months digitally in Portugal. Uh, technology will be an enabler not only for communication, but in terms of our companies, how to implement new operation models, new business models, how to take advantage of, of, of technology to not only increase the awareness, but the efficiency of companies. Innovation, our tourism innovation um, area is working very hardly to connect the dots between product and technology and startups, and of course, sustainability. We just launched a program for the next three years, uh, implementing sustainability in a very serious and uh, acting way in Portugal. In terms of the industry as a whole, I would say that uh, we need to stop being seen either as victims or villains. Uh, and we've, tourism has been seen for many years uh, as victims or villains. And we've seen what's happening right now. And the only way to change this is if, if we understand, all of us, that tourism is a force for good, even controlling the pandemic. And if we don't realize that, we will lose jobs, unemployment will grow. There will be social uh, instability in any country. And this is affecting any country. It's not only Portugal. Big, uh, big countries are suffering from the lack of tourism, from the lack of mobility between countries. This is crucial for us. So I would say that over the next two months, I would hope to see tourism being recognized as a force for good in any country and trying to address the issues that we need to solve our problems. John, a chance for the industry to move away from victim or villain titles or uh, depictions. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's absolutely right. I think uh, building that trust, in some cases, rebuilding that trust and recognizing where things have not worked is going to be important. And I, I think we'll see, I think we'll see at, at company level and, and sector level uh, initiatives around that. And I think it's a really positive thing. Um, but I would like to pick up the theme. There, there are things we need to get back to around sustainable development. Yeah. Um, that I think go hand in hand with that consumer um, demand for better. Um, I think there's a recognition that um, the industry's role as a force for, for good um, is real, but we need to deliver on that. And I think there's a huge amount this industry can do to help the recovery of destination communities who've often been the hardest hit uh, around the world. I think that's fantastic. Uh, I'm going to go for a plug, Tanya, so forgive me. Um, ABSA at WTM has just published its Tourism for Good report. It's titled The Roadmap for Rebuilding Travel and Tourism. Uh, it's available for anyone listening to download free of charge at absa.com. And it's exactly uh, on this theme. Um, and I think, you know, many of our, our industry bodies, organisations, not just us, um, are, are trying to bring us back to this theme. And I think that is really, really important. It's It's very easy to be uh, and quite rightly to be focused on short-term recovery and frankly, survival. Um, but we must get back to those themes um, that build true confidence and you know, quality for, for the future. Uh, lots of practical tools um, out there. Um, our uh, Travel Life um, subsidiary um, has won one of the uh, uh, WTM World Responsible Tourism Awards um, last week around its operational guidance kit. Um, and that's really linking the bridge from uh, COVID related issues and rebuilding confidence as, as Luis's and indeed Carrie's schemes in their destinations are. It's about that assurance to consumers um, that it's safe to travel and accommodations are doing the right thing. And, it, and again, that's something anyone listening um, can download free of charge at travellifestaybetter.com forward slash COVID hyphen 19. There you go, end of plug. Um, but yeah, I think it's all about rebuilding, rebuilding confidence and then building back better, which our industry yeah. is uniquely uh, able to do globally. Yeah. 
Carrie, um, just on this thought of sustainability, because this is this is something that has been talked about, obviously in the context of Venice in particular, but that tourism hasn't always been good for the environment. Is that something that Singapore is thinking about how to build back better, as John has put it? Um, I, I think we recognize that with COVID, you know, people's uh, fundamental uh, decision making on 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 and tourism decisions, the way they want to go, uh, will be changed, uh, you know, because of, you know, the different norms and expectations. Um, now everyone's thinking um, on health and safety of, of, of the destination, um, you know, other than also, you know, the, what, what that holiday uh, will will bring. Uh, but I think health and safety will continue to be paramount in the decision making. So in terms of, of you know, the themes of sustainability, uh, we think that, you know, mass, mass travel in, in what we, we used to be used uh, to used to refer to uh, will not come back uh, likely because it's not desirable. Um, and uh, the trend is towards the development of more niche um, uh, personalized uh, products um, and this might be you know targeting at smaller numbers but you know higher yield um, and and this is something that we think uh, will be more sustainable even in the context of, of Singapore um, and that our industry partners will have to adapt um, and to provide uh, the services and the experiences uh, that will be relevant because it's what people uh, would desire going forward um, yeah Okay, so to finish off, I just want a sentence from each of you, how, how you're feeling um, about the prospects for uh, 2021. Lewis, let's start with you. Are, are you feeling positive about the way forward next year? Can we skip to 2022? <laughs> I don't think you have that choice. I want my money back already for 2020, as many people no, no, no. said. I'm, you know. I'm, very, I'm very confident for 2021. I'll tell you why. I think we're all doing our part. And at least in Portugal, uh, companies are being prepared. Uh, people are ready and eager to welcome anyone uh, the same way uh, they did over the past few years. Uh, so I would say that this is the moment to prepare the future. And uh, as you said previously, and all of us said, it's time to learn the lessons and apply them to the future. With one big concern, that's my biggest concern, the lack of coordination and cooperation. Uh, our biggest competitor now is not, it's not uh, Singapore, it's not uh, our neighbor countries, it's fear. It's our biggest enemy. And the only way to fight fear is having a clear co coordination from all sectors. So that's, that's our biggest. If we can do that, and I'm sure we can, we will, then 2021 will be the recovery year and we will uh, come back once again, with tourism as a force for good, for sure. Alan, 2021 thoughts? No, I, I'm very bullish about 2021. I think that the trends in terms of medicine are going in the right direction. I think the customers that I talk to are really eager to get away. And I think there's some learnings on the back of both increased levels of trust in organizations and actually technology playing a role that will allow us to sort of surf that, that wave. Um, I think 2021 is going to be a really exciting year, not least because people who couldn't get away on holiday last year are absolutely itching to get out there yes. and, 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 you know, holiday with confidence and zest next year. Pent up demands, John, that's what we've got now, is it? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. That's how I feel about it. Um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be in full-time employment and, you know, not to have suffered uh, some of the issues industry colleagues have. Um, but, um, yeah, um, I think that's what we all want, isn't it? And uh, I think I think that latent demand, that backlog of uh, desire for travel is going to come through. Uh, I think Luis was spot on. We've got to make sure that uh, that isn't undermined um, through human factors, through organisation. Um, but I think, you know, the consumer is ready, willing and really, really wants to, to travel. I, I think some of the market opportunities are enormous. And I, you know, we only briefly touched on it and it's not really the core theme of this session. But, um, you know, we've, we've changed the way we think about work. Um, and I think it will be fascinating to see how just regular work combined with travel 
it's not even the digital nomad thing. It's just doing your regular job. We all now know and believe that we really, really can work from anywhere. We can do it from home. We've learned how to do it. Employers and employees have got comfortable with that. I think that's a game changer. I think there's a very different way of combining travel and experience and life that will come out of this in, in a way that um, perhaps would not have accelerated if we hadn't all have had this six month practice run working from home. So I think that's fascinating. And I'd just like to finish on the building back yeah. better theme again. I think it's huge, huge opportunity here to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we've all come through this with some different perspectives on priorities. And I think as an industry, uh, we need to embrace that in terms of our responsibilities, in terms of that power for good for destinations um, that our industry can be. And finally, Carrie, let's give the final word to you. Is 2021 a year of opportunity, do you think? Um, I will say that I need to caveat that. I think we are all hopefully uh, cautiously optimistic, but I think it will be a difficult year, um, at least for Singapore. Uh, we, we think that the recovery will still be slow, uh, but what we're trying to do is to ensure uh, that our people in the tourism industry there, um, you know, are, are redeployed in the right areas. We managed to try and keep as many jobs as possible whilst the international travel borders uh, are not reopened yet. Um, part of the, the plan is to you know, ensure that everyone helps to, to look at how they innovate um, and how they reimagine the new Singapore product together with us. So I think partnerships are very important uh, between private and government. I think partnerships that the tourism board can have with our international partners, whether or not it's our other tourism boards, um, you know, MICE associations and all, those are what we need to do to survive and to get over this crisis. Because I think the learnings and the open communication, um, you know, uh, and, and sharing uh, uh, our stories, uh, that's what we need to do at this point in time so that um, you know we all uh, are learning uh, at the same pace and trying to get over this crisis together in as quick a manner as possible. Getting, getting through the crisis together I think you've got it there but I think that's all we've got time for so I'd like to thank our panelists very much indeed for their fascinating insights into how to balance risk now going forward in the industry. Um, just to let you know this session along with others that we've held will be available to watch on the WTM website and I'd just like to encourage all of our um, viewers and listeners as well to take a look at BBC World, uh, BBC World TV, BBC World News, BBC anything at all, BBC online, um, for staying up to date with developments in the industry and indeed in other areas of life. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, all of you. Bye-bye.